Good evening, everyone. That was my attempt at a spooky voice. Um, let's all just be thankful I didn't try my Vincent Price impression on you. I want to thank everyone for joining us for our first ever Campfire Ghost Stories program. This is going to be a recurring program, and you can find future dates on our website. While our adult story time on Fridays focuses on myths and fairy tales, this is a chance to feel the thrills and chills that ghost stories would give you as a child. And while we're on the subject of children, this series does feature stories with material and themes that may not be appropriate or might prove challenging for younger listeners. It is intended for adults, uh, so we're not saying children can't listen, but parental discretion is advised. Today, we're going to offer you two ghost stories. The first is called The Man Who Sang to Ghosts, and it's based on the story of Hoichi from the tale of the Heike, um, which is an ancient Japanese legend. My sincerest apologies if I mispronounce anything. I promise you I am doing my very best. Let's begin. Today's battle is our last, the commander in chief told the men on the ship's deck. Remember your honor and fight to the end. What more do we have to live for? And indeed, it was their last. No family in all Japan had held greater power than the Heike, or had risen to it so swiftly, but their fall had been even swifter. Chased from the capital city, they had been hounded for nearly two years, and now the remnant of the clan and its loyal samurai warriors were arrayed in boats and ships off the coast of Danuura, ready for their final stand against an enemy fleet. As arrows flew and swords whirled, as dead and wounded samurai fell in the boats or dropped in the sea, the doom of the Heike grew clear. Then the clansmen, dressed in full armor, jumped into the waves, drowning themselves rather than fall into enemy hands. One ship bore the child emperor and the court ladies. When the emperor's grandmother saw that the end was near, she took the emperor in her arms and declared, Woman though I am, I will not let the enemy lay hands on me. I will go where the emperor must go. Where are you taking me, grandmother? asked the puzzled boy. Fighting tears, she told him, away from this world of sorrow to a happier one. Another capital lies beneath the waves. And hugging him closely, she plunged into the sea. The twanging notes of the biwa drifted over the temple garden and the hot summer night. Sitting cross-legged on the veranda, softly plucking the strings of the lute, was a blind young man named Koichi. He was dressed in the robe of a Buddhist priest, and his head was shaved like one. But he was not a priest. He was a bard, one of the many blind bards who for centuries had kept alive the tale of the Heike. Sometime around midnight, unable to sleep in the heat, Hoichi had come out in the evening air with his biwa to keep him company. As he played, he thought about the weeks since his coming to live at the temple of Akama. How lucky he was that the priest had invited him. As talented as Hoichi was, he was just starting his career, so he was grateful he no longer had to worry about food or lodging. Then, too, there was the honor and thrill of residing in a temple so closely linked to the Heike. Danuro, the place of their final battle, was just at the edge of town, and it was to appease the restless Heike spirits that the townspeople had built this temple, along with a cemetery nearby, where the priests held services in front of Heike memorial tombs. As for the spirits themselves, they no longer caused too much trouble but they still showed themselves on dark nights, appearing as small, ghostly flames that hovered over sea and sand. Demon fires, they were called. Hoichi's old teacher had told him, to perform the tale of the Heike, you must know the Heike well, and were better to come to know them than the temple at Akuma. Hearing something, Hoichi stopped his playing and listened. Through the night came footsteps, measured by a steady clank, clank, the sound of armor. A samurai coming to the temple, thought Hoichi, what could he want at this hour? The footsteps moved through the back gate of the temple and across the garden. Clank, clank. They were coming straight toward him. As the young man's heart beat faster, the footsteps halted before the veranda. Hoichi, sir, replied the young man. Then he added, please, sir, I am blind. I cannot see who you are. You have nothing to fear, said the voice. My master, a lord of high rank, is lodging nearby. He came to visit Danura, the scene of the famous battle. Now he hears of your talent in reciting the tale of the Heike. He wishes you to come at once to perform for himself and his attendants. I am most honored, said Hoichi. The young man slung his biwa on his back and slipped into his straw sandals. 
Then his arm was clasped in a grip of iron and he was led rapidly away. They started down the road to town, then turned toward the shore. Where could we be going? thought Hoichi. The great lord cannot stay on the beach. But before long they stopped, and the samurai called, Open! The young man heard the sounds of a large double door gate swinging wide. How strange, thought Hoichi. I know nothing of a great house here. They crossed a large yard, mounted some steps, removed their sandals, and passed through another door. Then, Hoichi was led down long hallways of polished wooden floors around many corners and across wide rooms carpeted with straw matting. At last, they entered what Hoichi could tell was a huge room filled by a great company. Silk robes rustled like leaves in a forest, and the air hummed with a multitude of soft voices. Hoichi was led forward to a cushion on the floor, and the iron grip withdrew from his arm. The young man kneeled and set down his biwa, then bowed to the lord he knew must be seated before him. Hoichi, the stern voice of an old woman, came from slightly to the left. The rest of the room fell silent. You will now recite for us the tale of the Heike. It is my honor, said Hoichi, bowing again. But the tale of the Heike takes many nights to perform in full. Which portion do you wish to hear tonight? There was a pause, and Hoichi sensed a tension in the room. Then a man's deep voice came from slightly to the right. Recite the tale of the Battle of Danura. Of all tales, it is the most poignant. Hoichi bowed once more, sat cross-legged, took up his biwa, and tuned it. Then, taking his large pick made of horn, he began to play. Never had Hoichi played better than before this great company. In the tones of his biwa were the roar of the sea, the whistling of arrows, the crashing of boats, the clanking of armor, the clanging of swords, cries of fierce warriors. And then Hoichi's voice lifted in chant. He sang of the gathering of forces at the scene of battle, the first formal exchange of arrows, the words of the commander-in-chief. He sang of the initial advances of the Heike, still hopeful, then the turning of the tide against them and the desertion of many supporters. He sang of the Heike clansmen holding fast to extra armor, even boat anchors, to speed their journey to the bottom of the sea. At first, the listeners were quiet, almost unnaturally so. But as the performance went on, they seemed to grow restless, anxious. Hoichi heard little exclamations, sounds of men weeping. Never have I affected an audience so deeply, thought Hoichi proudly. Encouraged by this, he performed even more brilliantly, even more movingly. But as he began to sing of the emperor's grandmother, her taking the boy in her arms, the words she spoke to him, the cries and weeping grew louder, until Hoichi became uneasy. And when he sang of their leap into the waters, the company burst out into such wild wailing that Hoichi was frightened. What has aroused them so, he wondered. Can my performance alone have done this? Hoichi finished, and the noise in the room slowly subsided. Somewhere in front, a boy's quiet whimpering faded away. Hoichi, said the old woman, we had heard high praise of your playing and reciting, but never did we imagine such skill as you have displayed. Our lord will remain here two more nights. You must come each night at the same hour and perform the tale again, and be assured, on the last night, you will be well rewarded. Thank you, said Hoichi, bowing again. But be warned, continued the woman. Our lord does not wish his presence here known. Tell no one of your coming. The iron grip fell again on Hoichi's arm and led him quickly back the way he had come. No one had seen Hoichi leave the temple, but the priest, returning after midnight from a service he had performed, happened to enter by the back gate, and he noticed that Hoichi's sandals were gone from the veranda steps. Checking inside, he found that the young man was not in his room. Where could he be so late, he wondered. The next morning, when the priest rose, he checked again and found Hoichi on his sleeping mat, deep asleep. Hours later, a servant reported that the young man was up at last, and the priest sent for him. Hoichi, you've worried me. You're out very late, and none of the servants knows anything about it. Why would you go out like that on your own? It was nothing, said Hoichi. Just a little business I had to attend to. Please don't concern yourself. But the young man's answer worried the priest still more. It was not like Hoichi to be secretive. Later, he told one of the servants, Keep a lookout tonight. If Hoichi leaves again, follow and see where he goes. That night, the servant kept watch on Hoichi's room from a far corner of the garden. Clouds covered the moon, and it began to drizzle. The servant huddled under a tree, but the rain grew heavier. It's almost midnight, grumbled the man. He won't leave so late, and not this rain. I'm going to bed. But just then, he saw Hoichi come out of his room with his biwa and sit on the covered veranda. What's he up to? mumbled the servant. Hoichi sat for a long time, softly playing the biwa. Then he stopped and seemed to listen to something. 
All at once, he stiffened and called out, Sir! The puzzled servant looked around. Who does he think he's talking to? He saw Hoichi rise, sling his biwa on his back, slip into his sandals, and come down the steps. The young man did not even seem to notice the rain. Walking more briskly than a blind man should, he crossed the garden and passed through the gate. The servant rushed inside and grabbed a lantern, but by the time he got out to the road, Hoichi was already out of sight. The rain was now falling in sheets. Hoichi! Hoichi! He hurried toward town, expecting to catch up at any minute, but he didn't see a soul. How could he move so quickly? I'd better find him or the priest will be furious. The servant reached town, still without seeing Hoichi. He knocked on the doors of every house and establishment he could remember the young man visiting, but all he got for his efforts were the curses of those he awakened. It's no use, he told himself. I've tried everywhere. He started back to the temple, walking this time by way of the shore. But then, amid the howling of the wind and the beating of the rain, he heard the tones of a biwa and a voice raised in chant. It's him, he cried, and he hurried towards the sounds. Once more, Hoichi sat amid the noble company. Once more, his biwa and his voice brought to life the Battle of Danura. Once more came the little outbursts, the sounds of weeping, growing louder, more anguished, more fervent, until... Hoichi! What's this? thought Hoichi. It sounds like one of the temple servants. But what is he doing here? And how could he think of interrupting me like that? Hoichi kept playing, kept singing. The emperor's grandmother, taking the boy in her arms, stepping to the edge of the ship. Hoichi! Hoichi! The voice was in his ear, and a hand was on his shoulder, shaking him. The listeners in the room had grown strangely quiet. Hoichi kept playing his biwa, but said in a low, desperate voice, Are you out of your mind? I am performing for this noble company. Go away, or you will bring disaster on us both. Hoichi, you are bewitched. There is no noble company. You are sitting in the rain here in the cemetery of the Heike. In front of you are the memorial tombs of the emperor, his grandmother, and the commander-in-chief. And all around you are hundreds of demon fires. What are you talking about? said Hoichi. I am in a palace performing for a great lord. The servant did not argue further. Much bigger than Hoichi, he slipped an arm across the young man's chest and hauled him off the muddy ground. Stop! cried Hoichi, struggling against the grasp. Please, leave me alone. You'll ruin everything. Ignoring both pleading and struggling, the servant dragged him toward the cemetery gate. The priest looked with pale, with concern on the pale, downcast figure before him. Hoichi, I'm glad you have finally trusted me enough to explain yourself, and I hope you now understand that it was not for a great lord you performed the tale of the Heike, but for the spirits of the Heike themselves. I understand, said Hoichi softly. Good, said the priest. Then you should also understand that the only reward they would give you would be to tear your body to pieces, to give you the honor of joining them forever. You are in great danger, my friend. The samurai will surely come again this third night, and if you go with him this time, you will not return. The young man trembled. None of us here, said the priest, could oppose this ghostly warrior, but I have thought of a way to save you. To make it work, you'll need great courage and strength of will. Are you willing to try? I am, said Hoichi. On the priest's request, the man stripped off his clothes. Then the priest took a brush and ink and began to write on Hoichi's body. I am inscribing on you a passage from sacred scripture. When the holy text covers every part of your body, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, you will be invisible to the spirits. Tonight, when the samurai calls you, sit still and do not make a sound. He will not be able to find you. When he leaves without you, you'll be free from danger for good. At last, the priest finished writing. I'm afraid I now have a duty I cannot avoid. I must hurry out to perform a service in a nearby village, and I won't be back till very late. But if you do just as I have told you, you'll be perfectly safe. Good luck, my friend. That night, a little before midnight, Hoichi stepped from his room and sat on the veranda. His biwa lay in his lap, but he did not play it. He sat still, trying to calm the beat of his heart. At last, he heard it. Clank. Clank. Through the back gate. Clank. Clank across the garden. Clank. Clank. Before the veranda. Clank. Hoichi. The young man caught at his breath and forced himself not to reply. Hoichi. He tried to stop shaking. Hoichi. His hands clenched as he willed himself not to faint. Hmm, said the voice in front of him. I see the biwa, but of the bard I see nothing. The footsteps moved onto the veranda and circled partway around him. Nothing, that is except two ears. Two ears? How can he see my ears? The steps moved directly behind him. A bard with no hands or mouth will hardly serve my lord, 
Still, I must show I have followed orders as best I can. I had better take the ears. Hoichi rose, froze in terror. He felt two hands clamp his ears in an iron grip and... Later that night, the priest returned from the nearby village. Anxious to check on Hoichi, he entered by the back gate and crossed the garden. Then he stopped in horror. Hoichi, he cried. He rushed to the veranda. My dear friend, what have they done? There lay Hoichi, still and silent, his head resting in a pool of blood. The young man was barely alive. The priest himself bandaged the wounds and sat all night by Hoichi's mat. It was late morning before Hoichi st stirred. Almost at once, he reached up to the sides of his head and touched the cloth that was wound over and around. The eyes of the priest filled with tears. My friend, I'm so sorry. It was all my fault, my terrible, terrible fault. I thought I had covered your ears completely with the sacred writing, but in my haste to leave, I forgot to write on your ears. Hoichi recovered, and as time went on, prospered as well. Word of his adventure spread, and many curious lords and ladies traveled great distances to hear him play and recite. So he gained both fame and wealth. What's more, Hoichi's encounter gave his performance a depth achieved by few others. For as his teacher had told him, to perform the tale of the Heiki, you must know the Heiki well. And who would care to know them better than the man called Hoichi the Earless? So ends the first tale. Our second story comes from a short story collection called Revenge, Eleven Dark Tales, by Yoko Ogawa. The story is called Old Mrs. J. My new apartment was in a building at the top of a hill. From my window, there was a wonderful view of the town spread out like a fan below and the sea beyond. An editor I knew had recommended the place. The hill was planted with fruit, a few grapevines and some peach and laquat trees. The rest was all kiwis. The orchards belonged to my landlady, Mrs. J, but she was elderly and lived alone and she apparently left the trees and vines to themselves. There was no sign of laborers working in the orchard and the hill was always quiet. Nevertheless, the trees were covered with beautiful fruit. The kiwis in particular grew so thick that on moonlit nights when the wind was blowing, the whole hillside would tremble as though covered with a swarm of dark green bats. At times, I found myself thinking they might fly away at any moment. Then one day, I realized that all the kiwis had disappeared from one section of the orchard, though I had seen no one picking them. After a few days, the branches were again covered with tiny new fruit. Since I was in the habit of writing at night and sleeping until almost noon, it was possible I had simply missed the workers. The building was three stories tall and U-shaped. In the center was a spacious garden with a large eucalyptus tree for shade when the sun was too bright. Mrs. J grew tomatoes, carrots, eggplants, green beans, and peppers, which she shared with her favorite tenants, I assumed. Her department, her apartment, was directly across the courtyard from mine. A single curtain hung in her window. The other was missing and she seemed to be in no hurry to replace it. Whenever I looked up from my desk, I would see that orphaned curtain. From what I could tell, Mrs. J led a quiet, monotonous life. As I was getting up each day, I could see her through the window, sitting down in front of her TV, wearily eating her lunch. If she happened to spill something, she would wipe it up with the tablecloth or her sleeve. After lunch, she would pass the time knitting or polishing pots or simply napping on the couch. And by the evening, when I was at last beginning to get down to work, I would see her changing into a worn out nightgown and crawling into bed. I wondered how old she was. Well past 80, I imagined. She was unsteady on her feet and was constantly bumping into chairs or knocking over something on the table. In the garden, however, she was a different woman. She seemed years younger and much more at ease when she was watering or staking the plants or plucking insects with her tweezers. The clicking of her shears as she harvested her crop echoed pleasantly through the courtyard. A stray cat turned out to be the reason for my first gift of vegetables for Mrs. J. Nasty thing! She screamed, brandishing a shovel. I spotted a cat slinking off toward the orchard. It looked nearly as old as Mrs. J and seemed to be suffering from a skin disease. I opened the window and called out that she should spread pine needles around the beds. But in response, she just turned and walked toward me, apparently still quite angry. I can't stand them, she said. They dig up the seeds I've just planted, leave their smelly mess in the garden, and then have the nerve to make that terrible racket. Pine needles around the beds would keep them away. I repeated. Why do you suppose they insist on coming here and ignore all the other yards? I'm allergic to the hair. It gives me sneezing fits. Cats hate prickly things, I persisted. 
So pine needles, someone must be feeding them on the sly. If you see anyone leaving food out, would you mind telling them to stop? As she made this last request, she came marching into my apartment through the kitchen door. Having finished her dry diatribe against cats, she looked around with poorly disguised curiosity, studying my desk and the cupboard and the glass figurines on the windowsill. So, you're a writer, she said, as though she found the word difficult to pronounce. That's right. Nothing wrong with writing, she said. It's nice and quiet. A sculptor used to live in this apartment. That was awful. I nearly went deaf from all the pounding. She tapped on her ear and then went over to the bookcase and began reading out titles as she traced the spines with her finger. Yet, she got them all wrong. Perhaps she was losing her eyesight, or simply did not know how to read. Mrs. J was extremely slender. Her face was narrow, and her chin long and pointed. She had a flat nose, and her eyes were set widely apart in a way that gave the middle of her face a strange blankness. When she spoke, her bones seemed to grind together with each word, and I feared that her dentures might drop out of her head. What did your husband do? I asked. My husband? He's nothing but a lousy drunk. I've had to manage for myself, living off the rents from the building and the money I earn giving massages. Bored with the bookcase, she next went to my word processor and tapped gingerly at a key or two, as though it were a dangerous object. He gambled away everything I made and didn't even have the decency to die properly. He was drunk and went missing down at the beach. I'd love to get a massage when you have time, I said, eager to change the subject for fear she would go on forever about her husband. I sit all day and my neck gets terribly stiff. Of course, she said, whenever you like. There's some strength left in these old hands. Then she cracked her knuckles so loudly, I thought she might have broken her fingers. As she left, she gave me five peppers she had just picked from her garden. When I got up the next day, the whole courtyard was covered with pine needles. They were scattered from the trunk of the eucalyptus to the storage shed, everywhere except in the vegetable beds themselves. I overheard from my window one of the tenants ask about the needles, and Mrs. J explained that they were to keep the cats away. Cats hate pine tar, she said. My grandmother taught me that years ago when I was a girl. I wondered whether she had ever been a girl. Somehow I felt she had been an old woman from the day she was born. One evening, Mrs. J had a visitor, apparently a rare occasion. A large, middle-aged man appeared at her apartment. The moon, full and orange, lit up her window more brightly than ever. The man lay down on the bed, and she sat on top of him. At first I thought she was strangling him. She appeared to have much greater strength than I had realized. She had pinned him down with her weight and gripped the back of his neck with her powerful hands. It seemed as though he were withering away while she grew more powerful, wringing the life from his body. The massage lasted quite a long time. The darkness between our two windows was filled with the smell of pine needles. Mrs. J began to come to my apartment quite often. She would have a cup of tea and chatter on about something. The pain in her knee, the high price of gas, the terrible heat, and then go home again. In the interest of preserving good relations with my landlady, I did my best to be polite, and with each visit, she brought more vegetables. She also began receiving letters and packages from me when I was out. This came for you, she'd say, arriving at my door almost before I'd had time to put down my purse. Just as I could see everything that went on in her apartment, she missed nothing that happened in mine. A delivery truck brought it this afternoon, she added. Thank you, I said. It looks like a friend has sent me some scallops. If you like, I'll bring some over for you later. How kind of you. They're my favorite. But I nearly became ill when I opened the package. The scallops were badly spoiled. The ice pack had long since melted and they were quite warm. When I pried open a shell with a knife, the scallop and viscera poured out in a liquid mass. I checked the packing slip and found that they had been sent more than two weeks earlier. Look at this, Mrs. J called as she came barging into my apartment one day. What is it? I asked. I was in the kitchen making potato salad for dinner. A carrot, she said, holding it up with obvious pride. But what a strange shape, I said pausing over the potatoes. It was indeed odd, a carrot in the shape of a hand. It was plump, like a baby's hand, and perfectly formed. Five fingers with a thick thumb and a long finger in the middle. The greens looked like a scrap of lace decorating the wrist. I'd like you to have it, Mrs. J said. Are you sure, I said, something this rare? Of course, she said, and put her lips close to my ear to whisper. I've already found three of them. This one is for you, but don't mention it to anyone. Some people might be jealous. I could feel her moist breath. Is that potato salad? She added. Then my timing is perfect. A carrot is just the thing. She laughed with delight. I sensed the lingering warmth of the sun as I washed the flesh of the carrot. Scrubbing turned it bright red. I had no idea where to insert the knife, but I decided it would be best to begin by cutting off the five fingers. One by one, they rolled across the cutting board. That evening, my potato salad had bits of the pinky in the index finger.
The next day, a strong wind blew all through the afternoon and deep into the night. Whirlwinds swept down the hillside and through the orchard. I could sense the trembling of the kiwis. I was in the kitchen, reading over a manuscript I had recently completed. Whenever I finished a piece, I always read it aloud one last time. But that night, I was probably reading to muffle the howl of wind blowing through the branches of the fruit trees. When I looked up at the window over the sink, I caught sight of a figure in the orchard. Someone was running down the steep slope in the dark. I could only see the back, but I could tell that the person was carrying a large box. When the wind died for a moment, I could even hear the sound of footsteps on the grass. At the bottom of the hill, the figure emerged into the circle of light under a street lamp, and I could see that it was Mrs. J. Her hair was standing on end. A towel she had tucked into her belt fluttered in the wind, threatening to blow away at any moment. The bottom of the carton she carried was bulging from the weight of its contents. The load was clearly too heavy for a woman of Mrs. J's size, but she seemed to manage it without much difficulty. Eyes firm, back straight, she balanced the load with amazing skill, almost as if the box had become a part of her. I went to the window and stared out. A stronger gust of wind blew through the trees, and for a moment Mrs. J lost her footing, but she quickly recovered and moved on. The rustling of the kiwis grew louder. Mrs. J went into the abandoned post office at the foot of the hill. I had passed it from time to time when I was out for a walk, but I had no idea what it was being used for now, or that it belonged to my landlady. When she finally came back to her apartment, the sea was beginning to brighten in the east. She got undressed with apparent relief, gargled, pulled a comb through her hair, and put on her old nightgown. She was once again the Mrs. J I knew, the one who bumped into furniture on the way from the bathroom to her bed, who had trouble simply buttoning her dress. I returned to my reading, and the manuscript damped, the manuscript damped now, from the sweat on my palms. Many more hand-shaped carrots appeared in the days that followed. Even after everyone in the building had received one, there were several left over. Some were long and slender, like the hands of a pianist. Others were sturdier, like those of a lumberjack. There were all sorts, swollen hands, hairy hands, blotchy hands. Mrs. J harvested them with great care, digging around each carrot and pulling, gent pulling, <clears throat> so sorry, pulling gently on the top to extract it as though the loss of a single finger would have been a great tragedy. Then she would brush away the soil and hold the carrot up in the sunlight to admire it. You're terribly stiff, Mrs. J said. I tried to reply, but she had me so completely in her grip that I could manage nothing more than a groan. I lay down on the bed as she had instructed, my face buried in a pillow, naked except for a towel around my waist. Then she climbed on my back and pinned me down with tremendous force. You sit all day. It's not good for you. She jabbed her thumb into the base of my neck, boring into the flesh. Look here, it's knotted up like a ball. I tried to move, to squirm free of the pain, but she had me clamped down tight with her legs, completely immobilized. Her fingers were cold and hard, and seemed to have no trace of skin or flesh on them. It was as though she were massaging me with her bones. We've got to get this loosened up, she said. The bed creaked, and the towel began to slide down my hips. Her dentures clattered. I was afraid that if she went on much longer, her fingers would scrape away my skin, rip my flesh, crush my bones. The pillow was damp with saliva, and I wanted to scream. That's right. Stand just a little closer together. Now, big smile. The reporter's voice echoed through the courtyard as he focused his camera. Perhaps he thought Mrs. J was hard of hearing. Hold the carrot just a bit higher. By the green so we could see all five fingers. That's it. Now don't move. We were posing right in the middle of the vegetable bed. The reporter trampling on pine needles as he positioned himself for the shot. The other tenants peered curiously from their windows. I tried to smile, but I couldn't. It was all I could do to keep my eyes open in the blinding sunlight. My mouth, my arms, my eyes, everything seemed to be coming apart and I felt terribly awkward. And thanks to the massage, I hurt all over. Pretend you're saying something to each other. Just relax and turn the carrot this way. It's all about the carrot. Mrs. J had done her best to dress up for the occasion. She had put on lipstick and wrapped a scarf over her head. The hem of her dress came almost to her ankles and she wore a pair of old fashioned high heels instead of her usual sandals. But the scarf only emphasized her narrow face, the lipstick had smeared, and somehow her formal dress and heels seemed to clash with the carrots. Make us look good, she told the reporter. In all my years, I've never once been in the paper. She let out a husky laugh, and her smile pinched up the wrinkles around her eyes. The article ran in the regional section of the paper, and next morning, curious carrots, hand-shaped and fresh from Granny's garden. Chest thrust forward to compensate for her slight frame, Mrs. J stood, listing a bit to the right as her high heel dug into the earth, and though she had laughed during much of the photo session, in the picture she looked almost frightened, but the carrot cradled in her hands was perfect. 
I stood next to her, holding a carrot of my own. In the end, I had managed a smile of sorts, but my eyes looked off in a random direction, and I was clearly tense and uncomfortable. The carrots appeared even stranger in the photograph, like amputated hands with malignant tumors dangling in front of us, still warm from the earth. Did you ever meet her husband? The inspector asked. No, I just moved into the building, I answered. Did she tell you he was dead? Asked another officer. Yes, she said he had been drinking and had fallen into the sea and died. Or maybe she just said that he was missing. I don't really remember. We weren't really very close. I glanced out at the courtyard. Mrs. J's apartment was empty. The single curtain fluttered in the window. Any little detail could be helpful. Did you notice anything suspicious? Said a young policeman, bending down to meet my gaze. Anything at all? Suspicious? I said. Suspicious. Um, once in the middle of the night, I saw someone running down through the orchard, carrying a heavy box. They took it into the post office, uh, the abandoned one at the bottom of the hill. The post office was searched and found to contain a mountain of kiwis. But when the fruit was cleared out, it revealed only the mangy body of a cat. Then a backhoe was brought up to turn out the garden, releasing a suffocating odor of pine needles. The tenants at their windows covered their noses. And as the sunlight fell behind the trees in the orchard, the shovel uncovered a decomposing body in the vegetable patch. The autopsy confirmed that it was Mrs. J's husband and that he had been strangled. Traces of his blood were found on her nightgown. The hands were missing from the corpse, and they never turned up, even after the whole garden had been searched. That concludes our campfire ghost stories. We hope that you enjoyed them, and we hope you'll join us next time for more spooky tales. Thanks, and have a great night.